morning, Bucknutters. Welcome to the Morning Five on Friday, October 3rd, 2014. I am Dave Biddle, and I'm joined by the people's champ, Matt Baxendale. Bax, we're a little more than 24 hours away from kickoff at Bird Stadium at Maryland. Ohio State is only favored by eight points. I find this interesting because the point spread opened at 10. The money is going toward Maryland. It's moved two points. Buckeyes favored by eight. Let's talk about our concerns in this game. Obviously, I think... Ohio State's going to be able to move the ball well against Maryland, but Maryland does some things offensively that could hurt Ohio State. They're a screen-happy team. They have a running quarterback if C.J. Brown's able to play. They do some things that have hurt Ohio State in the past. They have athletic wide receivers like Cincinnati did. They can hit you with the deep ball. Um, those are my concerns. I don't have many concerns offensively for Ohio State. It's defense slowing down Maryland. Um, what are your concerns going into this game tomorrow, Bax? Well, I think my concern is the same concern that everybody who's putting money on Maryland has, which is they saw Ohio State give up three touchdowns that were 60 yards and longer last game. And uh, to be honest, those two of them were giant arcing bombs, and the other one was a coverage mishap. So you have to be very worried when you're going against a team that is Deion Law and Stephon Diggs. I mean, Stephon Diggs, if he was on the Buckeyes last year, might have been that game-breaker kind of guy. If Stephon Diggs was on the Buckeyes this year, he would have certainly been that game-breaker kind of guy that Percy Harvin role that Urban Myers talks so much about. People forget that Stephon Diggs was a 50-50 choice between OSU and Maryland in Urban Myers' first recruiting class. He's really good. Uh, like you, I feel very good about the offense. The offense is rapidly accelerating itself back into the same place that it was last year, where I just assume Ohio State's going to score 40-plus points in any given game. Uh, J.T. Barrett's proven to be quite the quarterback. Uh, he's a completely different kind of quarterback than we're used to because of his ability to move it around. He's like Kenny Guyton, but with athletic pedigree. Um, but on the on, on the defensive side of the ball, it's going to be the test of the secondary, and that's going to continue to be the question that's going to be around this team until they prove consistently that they're not the team that's giving up long bombs. Uh, I'm very concerned about Stephon Diggs taking a 10-yard slam to the house. Um, I, I'm less concerned than a lot of people are about their kick return game. I know Maryland is a great return team, but OSU's kick coverage this year hasn't given me any – reason to really be particularly concerned. They were very good against Cincinnati. Um, they made a lot of stops inside the 20 uh, on the kickoffs at Ohio State repeatedly sent down towards the Bearcats. So, yeah, it comes down to one simple thing. Um, stopping that big pass play. And that's just, I know it sounds like a broken record the last two years, but that's where we are with this team. I like the fundamentals we've seen from this defense, but they have to stop letting up the big touchdowns. Period. And for this being the quote-unquote biggest game in Maryland history, you know that the Terrapins are going to be fired up to beat the Buckeyes. That's right. They're going to be up for this one. Their stadium only holds 54,000. It's about half the size of Ohio Stadium, but it's going to be loud there. And I, I was, I was, I was flat out taken aback when I heard this was the first sellout since 2008. It'd be different if they had this some huge stadium and they weren't selling out. That wouldn't surprise me because Maryland hasn't been good. But a 54,000 seat stadium, you haven't sold that out since 2008. So this is a huge game. I do think it's going to be a close game. So let's give our predictions here. I like Ohio State winning this game 35-24. So I do have the Buckeyes covering, but I think it's going to be a tight one. I don't think it's going to be 35-24 where Maryland comes back to make it look good. I think it's going to be a somewhat tight game but the Buckeyes will cover. So I have it 35-24, good guys. What do you say, Bax? Uh, I'm in a similar boat. I was thinking 38-27. This is a Maryland team that scored a lot of points in every game this year. Uh, Their defense is actually half decent. They just came off of uh, stopping Indiana, holding them only to 15 points the week after Indiana knocked off the defending SEC East champions. But on the other hand, this is also the same Maryland team that gave up 40 points to West Virginia. This is the same Maryland team that, really hasn't proven a lot on defense thus far, and uh, I like the Buckeyes to win. I I wouldn't be surprised if it was one of those games where OSU jumped out a little bit early in, like, the first quarter, say, if it was 14-0 real quick, and then Maryland kept it it pretty much even Steven the rest of the game. Uh, I do think Maryland is going to be taking a very big step up in competition. They have not faced a team kind of level that Ohio State has this season. While you were sleeping, listeners, Arizona upset Oregon. Now, I wish I could say I stayed up and, and watched the whole game, but since Bax and I have to get up and do the Bucknuts Morning 5, um, I missed the second half. And I have to say I was impressed that Arizona was hanging in there in the first half, and I expected to wake up and see that, oh, okay, Oregon won by 21, but at least you know, Rich Rudd made it interesting. No, Arizona 31, Oregon 24. So Rich Rodriguez with his biggest victory as head coach there. And Bax, as you said off the air, we will always hold him in, in high regard for what he did for the University of Michigan during his three years there. Yeah, God bless Rich uh, Rodriguez. 
That's right. And God bless Brady Hoke, too. Both of them together. I love those guys. Um, what does this say about Michigan State? Everybody thought, oh, Michigan State, even though they end up getting beat by, like, three touchdowns. Oh, they, they kept it close in the first half against Oregon. At Oregon, maybe Oregon's just not that good. They don't have Chip Kelly coaching them anymore. Uh, their defense has always been somewhat soft. I don't know. I mean, that, what does this say about Michigan State in your mind when you hear that uh, Arizona was able to beat Oregon? Um, honestly, I don't know if it affects Michigan State a ton. If Oregon only loses one game, then maybe head-to-head that that game will be brought into consideration. Uh, on the other hand, I think this says something else about Arizona. They're undefeated, by the way. Um, they just won a game a couple weeks ago on a Hail Mary pass against Cal. They are starting to get a little of that Auburn last year team of destiny look around them in the early going, and I know it's only at the start of October, but that Arizona team is winning, and winning in very intriguing fashion. Um, I think it's going to be fascinating to watch the Pac-12 play out. It's just such a deep league. There's so many good teams over there. Everybody who's speculating about the playoffs in early October it knows nothing, Jon Snow. That's the bottom line here. There's so much football left to play out. Uh, if people think that the Oregon loss to Arizona is going to magically affect Sparty, they're assuming Sparty's going to win out the rest of the way. Sparty's got undefeated Nebraska this weekend. We don't know how good Nebraska is yet, but they look pretty decent against Miami. The, all this playoff speculation, man, is beyond me. The only thing I know is that this was the most typical Oregon thing you can think of. They play against a team with a suddenly decent defense, and their offense doesn't put up 35 points in the first quarter, and all of a sudden they're in a dogfight, and they fold like usual. That's what happens to Oregon. Oregon, when they play against real defenses, and Rich Ron's quietly recruited a pretty decent athletic defense there in Arizona. Whenever they play them, they always get to collapse. If, if Oregon's not scoring 45 points in a game, and if they're not scoring it with ease, then they're going to lose. And I'm sorry, but I'm just used to it with Oregon at this point. They're always going to blow a game or two during the season, no matter how great they're made out to be. So expect the national team to keep shaking up. This is college football, and we're just getting into conference play. We have no idea who's going to win the national title this year because every year, the, the people in October are largely different than the people that start in December. Real quick on the recruiting front, Ohio State commitment Joe Burrow has the biggest game of his high school season tonight at Steubenville. Athens is 5-0, and heading to 4-1 and Steubenville. And Steubenville's only loss was last week, 21-13 to at Massillon, Washington. So, you know, Steubenville's always excellent. Uh, Athens is excellent this year under Joe Burrow, the future Buckeye. I'll throw some stats out there. 63 for 83 passing. That's a 75% completion percentage. 1,551 yards, 24 touchdowns, one interception. Those aren't even video game stats. I, I can't even put up those stats on video games. Those are beyond video game stats. I know he's doing it against weak competition. Not tonight, but usually he's doing it against weak competition. Still, I love what I'm seeing out of this kid, Max. He reminds me of Bobby Hoying, another kid that tore up you know, lesser competition in the state of Ohio, went on to be a three-year starter, very successful at Ohio State, played in the NFL. Um, if he turns out as good as Bobby Hoying, we'll all be happy. But your thoughts on Joe Burrow? I'm sure you followed his recruitment or following his stats. What are, what are your thoughts on Joey Burrow? Well, my thoughts are pretty simple on the kid. Since the day he's committed, I love the fact he's a coach's kid. He knows what it takes to be successful at a high level with his father being the defensive coordinator at OU. Uh, playing a team like Steubenville, they're going to be a very stiff test. But here's the thing. Let's say he goes out and lights them up again. You can't ask for more. I know the competition level isn't great, but you literally can't ask him to do better than he's done at this point. And everybody wants to talk about Torrance Gibson as the quarterback in this year's recruiting class. Candidly, I've been on the record saying this for a while. While I think Gibson's a much better player than he is a camper, you have to consider the fact that a guy like Burrow, in many respects, could be a very good similarity, a good comparison to a guy like JT Barrett. Maybe he's not quite the runner that Barrett is, but that distributor, we're seeing how dangerous that distributor can be in this kind of offense. With Kenny Guyton last year, and now with JT Barrett running the ball, essentially as a distributor, not as the running quarterback we've seen in the prior or Braxton Miller mold. Burrow's a kid, he's one of those kids who's always going to be kind of a second thought in the recruiting class. He's an Ohio kid, he's a rural Ohio kid. You know, he, he, he may be a four-star kid, but he's a low four-star kid. He's kind of like a Darren Lee who slips through the, cra- the cracks, but then all of a sudden, two, three years down the line, you're like, oh, wow, that kid's really good. Oh, what do you know? I didn't really give much thought at the time. He is one to keep an eye on. The combination of coach's kid and just this, these ridiculous numbers he's putting up, you have to take that into account when you look at this kid as his pedigree as a future player. I won't be surprised if he shows up at Ohio State and has himself in a pretty prominent quarterback role much quicker than you expect. 
because right now, let's face it, if JT Barrett's the long-term starter here uh, and Braxton Miller doesn't come back, Cardell Jones isn't going to want to sit forever. That's going to leave Stephen Collier, Joey Burrow, and, of course, if they get Terrence Gibson, then maybe he'll be a quarterback. But, again, he's probably a much bigger, quick impact guy at wide receiver. So keep an eye on, on, on our, our newest Buckeye quarterback commitment. I bet you he's going to have a very good game tonight because when you put up video game numbers, you don't just stop putting up video game numbers. This isn't Shane Morris who completed 50% of his passes his senior year and his junior year. This is a quarterback who actually can throw the football and knows how to play the position. Yeah, it's going to be fun. We'll keep the listeners updated on the front row message board, how the game is going. So check the front row message board for updates of Athens at Steubenville tonight. Thank you to the People's Champ. Thank you to all the listeners out there. Take it away, best damn band in the land. Bye.